Welcome to Golf Smarter Mulligans, your second chance to gain insight and advice from the best instructors featured on the Golf Smarter podcast. Great golf instruction never gets old. Our interview library features hundreds of hours of game improvement conversations like this that are no longer available in any podcast app. My philosophy is that I want to get you better in one lesson. That's the absolute goal. It's not band-aids. It's Here's the rotary swing fundamentals. Here's why they work. They're simple. You can learn them in 30 minutes and go out. I don't want to see you again. Go out and practice. Go out and play. Go out and have fun. You're going to hit the ball better than you ever have. You're going to compress the ball. You're going to hit it straighter. You're going to hit it more consistently. And it's simple to maintain. With another interview from the archives of Golf Smarter, here's your host, Fred Green. Welcome and thanks for downloading another episode of the Golf Smarter podcast. Have you had a chance to listen to the last episode yet? I got to tell you, the amount of email that I've received in the past week has been nuts. We've received more email about our conversation with David Lake of One Iron Golf System than any other topic we've had in months. I have to share some of it with you. Ken Sanford wrote in to say, amazing interview with president of One Iron Golf. I've been looking into their products for a while, but haven't made the plunge to buy a set yet. Especially since I was given a new set for Christmas. But after listening to this interview, I'm going to give them a shot. I entered the contest you're running for it. Any chance for a bribe? Ken, yes, there's always a chance. But it's probably cheaper to buy your own set. Stu Margulis said, Haven't been this excited about golf since Fred Shoemaker was on. Good stuff, and it makes so much sense. It's scary. Stu, Fred Shoemaker is coming back to Golf Smarter very, very soon. Stay tuned. Randy Shields commented, I must admit he made sense to me. One iron length actually makes more sense than a handful of different shafts to screw in and out of my Callaway driver with a retail price near that of a set of these single length irons. But even the negative feedback wasn't all that negative. Here's what Gary Gilbert wrote. These clubs may work for some folks, just as radically different swing systems work for some people. And I agree. The concept seems completely logical. Still, I have to think David's argument is flawed about why the major manufacturers have not embraced the concept. I think they'd offer a single-length shaft if testing showed they were better. They could always offer new and improved clubs since they have been doing so many technological advances with materials. Now, Gary, personally, I really understood David's position that the major manufacturers have to constantly come up with new product lines to stay in business. How else can they support huge R&D and marketing budgets? They've got to come up with new products all the time. So, you know, points go both ways. Anyway, from Stephen Spurlock, he wrote, Not to criticize, but you let them off pretty easy. I just cannot believe anyone can reasonably state that technology has not changed in the past 10 years, which would make him rethink his club design. And, you know, this argument's going to go back and forth for a long time. I'm just putting the information out there. It's up to you to decide whether you think the guy is legit or not. To a lot of us, it made a lot of sense. Our guest today is Chuck Quentin of RotarySwing.com and OnePlaneGolfSwing.com. Are you one of those players who is always tweaking and playing with the nuances of your swing? Then let me add a little more havoc into your life. (laughs) Welcome to the Golf Smarter Podcast, Chuck. Hello, Fred. How are you? I'm doing fine. Thanks for joining us. You bet. Hey, listen, can you just explain to me, because I really am baffled about the one-plane versus two-plane swing. I want to get right to it here because I'm sure this conversation will, will be filled with clarifications here. But let's just start with the distinction between what a one-plane versus a two-plane swing is. Sure. In, in its simplest form, you've, you've got to go back to look at what Jim Hardy set out to do with his distinction between the two, because he's the one that's definitely credited with doing it. And In its simplest forms, a one-plane swing is, is a much more around type golf swing in, in terms that the club and the arms work much more around uh, an inclined spine angle, and a two-plane swing is a much more upright swing where the arms work much more up and down and in front of the body. So in its simplest terms, there's there's a golfer who swings his arms up and down, and he looks at the swing and, and there's a more arms-dominated movement moving up in front of his body, and 
A one-plane swinger is someone who thinks of the swing as a little bit more tilted over, uh, using his body a little bit more like a baseball player and a much more body-dominated move, uh, still using the arms, but uh, in a long story short, it's, it's, that's the basic definition of the two. And I'm still, I, and excuse my ignorance here, but on the two-plane swing, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. Sure. Basically, in a long story short, the two-plane swing are the, the ideas that have been around for a long time, and they, they, anytime swing theories pop up seemingly out of the blue, they've been around a while, the, the, and they typically follow a trend. So, for instance, where the two-plane swing theories really started becoming popular was in the 60s and 70s when you had guys like Nicholas and Miller, Johnny Miller who were in their prime, and they swung their arms very, very upright. So almost where their left arm for a right-handed golfer would be almost vertical to the ground at the top of their backswing and be well above the shoulders. And before that, when you and that's when the, the two-plane swing stuff started becoming more prevalent within the teaching realm. Before that, in the 50s, you had the Hogan's and Sneeds of the world, and they tended to swing a lot more around their body. So you look at the classic you know, images from Hogan's book where his arms look like they're on the same plane or inclination as their shoulders. That was the trend of instruction back then. So the two-plane stuff really came out of golfers like Nicholas and Miller who swung much more upright. That was the way that they swung the golf club, and that was the idea of getting the club. At the end of the day, everybody's just trying to get the club back out in front of the body at impact. That's the, that's the goal of, the, of a repeatable golf swing is to bring it down on plane and in the proper positions. And both golfers, a one-planer and a two-planer, do those in two very different ways. The two-planer impact will have his arms much more in front of his body, almost as if his hands were in front of his chest. That's his goal at impact, is to bring the club back in front of his body using his arms to get his arms and hands in front of his chest. Now, one-planer, that would actually not happen. A one-planer is going to have his body much more open at impact where his hips and shoulders and chest have actually rotated and they're almost facing left of the target or facing more down the target line at impact, and his arms and hands are actually still back behind him, almost as if his hands were back by kind of his right pocket at impact. And that's the classic images you see of Hogan and, and Sneed. So both of them, at impact, have the club back in front of their body, but their bodies are in extremely different positions. So in a long story short, if those are the positions you're trying to treat, achieve at impact, the way that you take the club back is going to try and make those positions easier to accomplish. And that's why you see for a two-planer, he's trying to keep his hands and arms and club more in front of his body throughout the entire golf swing because it makes it easier to achieve those positions that impact. And the one-planer, he's getting his arms as far back behind his body as he can because he wants to have them back behind his chest at impact. So it all comes back down to what you're trying to do and what you're trying to achieve at the moment of truth, at the, at the moment of impact, and so that's why these two swing theories are very, very different, uh, very uh, different appearance-wise and, and technique-wise. I know that for me, um, and I don't know if this is an issue or not. I think it might be, but my hips seem to get out in front of my hands uh, at impact. Sure. So does that make me a one plane? <laughs> not necessarily, <laughs> and this is where you. you, you it, this is where our, the way that we teach the swing makes things a lot simpler, but to, to stick with the one-plane, two-plane ideas. And to, to clarify that, in, in my opinion, the way I view them is they're two polar opposites. Nobody actually adheres to these principles 100% one way or the other, or maybe even 90%. There, there are two extremes. They're black and white. It's two extremes of looking at how you would break down a golf swing and, and things that you're trying to achieve in the swing and the mechanics of the swing but not necessarily that you have to do everything 100%. So to answer your question, if your hips are out in front, now that could mean a lot of different things. Uh, that could be good and bad positions depending on what you're trying to do. So you have to look at more of what your body is doing at impact. This is one of the key decision makers that I look at when taking a golf student is do they tend to use their, for a right-handed golfer, do they tend to use their right hand, their right arm a lot coming into impact? And if so, are their shoulders very open at impact or very square? So if you find somebody whose shoulders are very square or even shut at impact, 
they'll have to use their right arm to achieve that goal I mentioned earlier, which is to bring the club back in front of the body at impact. If they don't, they would, you know, they would miss, they would hit three feet behind the ball. For a one planer, if his shoulders are open at impact, that's how he's bringing the club back down in front of his body to impact. So just because your hips might be out in front of the ball, that might just be a fault, but it doesn't necessarily classify you as one or the other. To me, uh, golf swings are almost like thumbprints. No, no two people have the same golf swing. But are Absolutely. we trying to achieve... Everybody to have a one or the other golf swing? And Not at all. Good. Not at all. I, I, I don't think that that was Jim Hardy's intentions, and, uh, and I'm speaking, putting words in his mouth here, but I'll, I'll tell you my interpretation of, of what it is, is, is that basically there, there are many different models on how to swing the club. And I personally, apart from my own rotary swing ideas, teach seven or eight different models, depending on what that golfer already does in his golf swing. And it might be a blending and a hybrid of three different things. You're trying to help the golfer play better. You know, you're not trying to, to stuff him into a set of mechanics that he doesn't have time or the inclination or even the desire to go and work on all day. Mm-hmm. But what Hardy did was said, look, there's not one way to do it. There's two. And I think it's, I look at it and say there's not one way. There's at least two and probably eight that are very valid mechanical ways to swing the golf club. And... At least he took the time and, and broke the mold to say, "Look, there's more than one, one way to skin a cat here." And that, you know, that's a, that was a huge, believe it or not, within the golf instruction world, that was kind of a big taboo thing. He actually got a lot of uh, flack when he when the Golf Digest article was published that originally introduced his ideas to the broad public. And a lot of people were saying, "You know, you shouldn't be doing this. This is terrible. You're going to confuse people, et cetera, et cetera." What in truth happened is that for a lot of people, it liberated them because they could now swing a way that was much more natural and athletic to them than what they were being force-fed from you know, the PGA of America, swinging one type of golf swing, and that's the only way to get it done. So it actually, it's not a way of stuffing people into one way or the other. It liberates them to have options, and that's really the goal because everybody, like you said, is going to have different, different mechanics, different things that they want to feel in the golf swing. And what is your goal? You have two different websites, um, at least. <laughs> There's, and we're talking rotaryswing.com, oneplaneswing.com. Uh, yeah, oneplanegolfswing.com. I yeah. apologize, oneplanegolfswing.com. And, uh, and we have a tech-savvy audience. I mean, they're, they're podcast listeners, so they understand the Internet, so they should check this out. Um, but what is it that you are trying to promote? Uh, very simple. What? What the rotary swing is, is is simply what we've spent time figuring out is the simplest way to swing the golf club, the simplest way to learn to swing the golf club. And now we're actually being endorsed by a medical panel that's uh, a neurosurgeon, orthopedic surgeon, chiropractors, massage therapists, all these fitness experts who have formed this national medical panel in the United States who's saying, look, this is the only biomechanically correct way swing a golf club. And that was never, when I set out to, you know, formulate these fundamentals and put them down in my book, it was never, I'm going to form a biomechanical way to swing a golf club. That, that was never the intent. It was simply a, a byproduct of looking at the swing and saying, look, this is what makes sense. This isn't rocket science. We're hitting a ball with a stick. What's the most efficient way to do it? And more importantly, how can you take anybody of any athleticism, any flexibility, any skill level, any coordination, and have them hitting the ball better right away. Because the truth of the matter is, the average guy, you know, he goes out and plays with his buddies on the weekend. He doesn't have time nor the desire to go and sit there and film the swing and spend lots of time on the range and hit balls and whatever. It's a time-consuming skill that you have to take time to develop. And a lot of guys just don't want to do it. And whether it's our... uh, our, our quick fix mentality that we have, or what have you, it does. We we address that now. Certainly, you can make the swing as technical and complex as you can, sophisticated as you want. But for the average guy, we try to keep it very simple. So we have very simple sets of fundamentals that allow you to hit great golf shots with the absolute minimum amount of learning time and uptime. So basically, our motto or my philosophy is that I want to get you better in one lesson. That's the absolute goal, and it's not band aids. It's 
here's the rotary swing fundamentals. Here's why they work. They're simple. You can learn them in 30 minutes and go out. I don't want to see you again. Go out and practice. Go out and play. Go out and have fun. You're going to hit the ball better than you ever have. You're going to compress the ball. You're going to hit it straighter. You're going to hit it more consistently. And it's simple to maintain. And that's the goal. So that's what how the whole rotary swing idea came about. Well, I'm sure you're going to touch a chord with a lot of golfers with that kind of attitude and that kind of approach because I think that people want quick fixes, uh, which golf is not. Right. But they sure would like to know that they're going to make some quick uh, progress in, in their game after their lesson. Absolutely. I mean, that's 110% what we do. And we, like I said, we don't do it with just Band-Aid fixes. And I know a lot of instructors, I think a lot of it is just they have a limited set of tools in their toolbox they look at the swing and say, well, there's one way to do it, and you're slicing it, so I'm just going to strengthen your grip really, really strong. Well, that's not a fundamentally correct way to fix something. It's just a Band-Aid fix. We look at it and say, well, okay, you're, you know, you're coming over the top and you're slicing it, but we need to teach you how to use your body correctly. That's a fundamentally correct way to fix something, and can be done easily as long as you have the right tools in the toolbox to look at this swing, address it the right way, and say, this is what you need to do. It's simple to fix. So... That's really the goal. I mean, like we said, everybody wants quick fixes, and, and golf is a game that you're going to learn for a lifetime. It doesn't matter what skill level you're at. But it doesn't mean that you have to sit out there and struggle for the rest of your life trying to learn positions and, and complicated techniques. Yeah, but fundamental quick fixes um, are, are a quick fix fundamentally. When, you, when you're looking at something on the fundamental side, that's not always an easy correction to make for someone who's been playing for a while and has their own rhythm, their own method, their own comfort level? Absolutely. You're going to run into challenges no matter what you do, but that, again, is where, you know, we've, we've had, you know, obviously very, very good success with, with the rotary swing with our students and lessons is because the, mecha- the, the mechanical fundamentals that we teach are very simple to learn, and it's very... It's very body dominated. The hardest thing to do with the golf club is to learn to manipulate it with your hands and arms. It's moving so fast throughout the swing that to learn how to position it and manipulate it and those things is very challenging to do. So what we do in the golf swing is we basically take the arms out of the equation. We take the movement of the club. Rarely do I talk about the backswing. I, I often will have lessons where uh, you know, 30 minutes into the lesson, the guy's hitting the ball the best he ever has, and I said, okay, now how much time do we spend talking about your backswing? And he just looks at me kind of dumbfounded. He's like, we didn't spend any time talking about my backswing. Hmm. But, but every lesson that they've ever had in the past is, okay, your hands need to be here as a takeaway, and the club face needs to be in this position. Now your arms need to be here. We don't have to go through those, all those ridiculous steps in order to get certain things down. We get... If the body can rotate correctly and the arms can be passive and follow, they do have a job to do, don't get me wrong, but it's a very simple role. We have a very simple drill called the rotary drill that we teach people how to do in in five minutes. And now the arms and the position of the club and all those things are no longer that consequential because the body is the engine of the swing that we're using to dominate everything, and it it doesn't move that far and it doesn't move that fast. So you can coordinate the movements much easier and still have a tremendous amount of power because you're learning to use the big muscles to power the swing. Is the one-plane swing for everybody? Well, now, in terms of how Jim Hardy, and this is where I hate to confuse things because I'm all about making things simpler, but (laughs) the way that Jim Hardy (laughs) defines uh, the one-plane swing, no. He he has specific um, requirements in terms of flexibility and those types of things. If you looked at, I would tell you to look at the the one-plane and two-plane swings as a scale. If you look at the extreme left-hand side, you have a one-plane swing. And if you look at the extreme right-hand side, you have a two-plane swing. Everybody else follows somewhere in the middle there. In terms of the rotary swing, it leans towards the one-plane swing side, but it's not a pure one-plane golf swing in the way that Hardy defines it. And, And I learned that through simple trial and error, to be honest. Being in Florida... I have tremendous amounts of retirees who come to me for lessons, and and they're the classic golfer. You know, they they go out and they play a lot, but they don't want to play. They want to go out and have fun. They don't want to spend all day on the range beating balls. It's too hot down here to do that anyway, especially during the summer. So we so when I would see these guys, like, oh, I've had my knee replaced and my shoulder's been done and I got a new hip and et cetera, et cetera, and you know, to get them into all these positions, 
I would have to send them, you know, send them through three months of work with a physical therapist just to get flexible enough to achieve the one plane swing position. Hey, hey, watch it. Don't make fun of us old guys. <laughs> I feel like I've had a lot of those surgeries done. Trust me. Yeah, lots, but lots of you're still not old. We are. <laughs> <laughs> so in order to help these guys, I had to develop different techniques in order to allow them to still hit the ball great but not have such extreme requirements in terms of flexibility. And You, know, you need a very steep spine angle for a one-plane swing. The rotary swing is much more neutral. It's much more down the middle. It's, it's more balanced is the words that I use. You don't have an extreme bent-over spine angle like you would in a one-plane swing. It's a neutral spine angle, about 35 degrees is pretty typical. Your arm, you know, you don't have to rotate, you know, 180 degrees with your shoulders. You don't have to do something crazy. It's, it's a very simple rotation. You turn as far as you can. You keep your arms passive and you rotate back through. And when you leave the lesson, your swing thoughts are turn and turn. That's, what, that's my goal is to get everybody thinking turn and turn, and that's it. So what is, what is the purpose of the spine tilt in the two-plane swing, and why is it not necessary for rotary swing? Well, again, it comes back down to what's your end goal, and your end goal is to hit the ground in the same place every time with the golf club, so you take a divot, and to bring the club back out in front of the body on the right plane and path. So, again, as, we, as these two swings are trying to accomplish that in two different ways, if you're trying to keep the club up in front of your body, which a two-planer is doing, right? His hands and arms and club are more or less theoretically going to stay more up and down in front of his body. If he bends over a lot or he gets a lot of spine tilt at a dress, his arms are going to want to work back behind his body. That's not going to help his goal of getting the club back out in front of his chest at impact. So he stands more erect and swings his arms more up and down. It's a much more vertical or a V-shaped swing path. Now, for the one-plane swinger, he wants to get his arms and hands far deep back behind his, his body as he goes back. So by bending over, that shallows out his swing plane, which already has a tendency to be very deep, and allows him to get his arms in a better position for the, the mechanics that he's uh, trying to achieve. Is there a simple way for uh, the average golfer to look in a mirror or to look at a video of themselves to say, uh, okay, my swing that I'm most comfortable with right now is a fill-in-the-blank? Absolutely. The simplest way is if you look in a mirror or video is best because the mirrors can be a bit misleading because you're not really hitting the ball. Where are your arms at the top of your backswing? Are your arms well steep above your shoulders or is your arms kind of level with your shoulders? That is a big in indication of how to start going down the track of whether or not you're, you're going to go one way or the other. The next one is to look at your body at impact. Are your shoulders very open to the target at impact, or are they very square? So if well, you're now, very... I'm going to stop you right there. When you say um, at impact, are they square to the ball or to the target? Now, and the, let's define what the target is. The target the flag or is the target the ball? The target line, let's use the okay, target, target line. line. Okay, yeah. okay. So, so at a dress, your shoulders are typically square to the target line, correct? Yes. Right. So at impact, a two-planer actually wants to return about to that same position where his chest is facing the ball again. A one-planer wants to be in a much more open position. He's going to use his body to rotate through the ball. So that means that when you say an open position, that means his shoulders are turned towards the target, not exactly. the target line. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Okay. So that that's the basic two things. If you're if you're at the top of your swing, if your arm is very shallow or level or close to being level with your shoulders, and you're open at impact, you certainly wouldn't want to read a lot of two plane information. And vice versa, if your arms are very steep at the top, but your shoulders are very square to that target line at impact, a one planer information is going to going to mislead you as well. Those are the two basic checks that I use to kind of help people figure out what's going to be best for them. So you're not trying to necessarily figure out uh, where they are or where to change them to? I mean, how can you know if, yeah, I have a tendency to be a two-plane, but I should be a one-plane? Is there a way to figure that out? There's, yeah, I mean, absolutely. it's more about what you naturally do in your swing. That's the top priority. Right. Because if you go against what you already naturally do, you just dramatically increase the learning time for you to be able to play better golf. So 
I look at those things and say, look, you already have these tendencies. You have these traits in your golf swing. Why would you, and you do them well, you're repeatable. Now, they may not necessarily produce the right results right now, but because they're good fundamentals within a certain set of fundamentals, we can work with that, give you the information you need to tweak it here and there. And now you can use what you already have rather than swimming upstream and saying, well, I want my swing to look like Tiger Woods. Well, how much time and money do you have? It's not necessarily going to be a good investment. So because you may not look anything like Tiger Woods, you may look more like Watch it. Jacobson. <laughs> Be careful. <laughs> Nobody looks like Tiger Woods. We know this. And why every instructor uh, insists on playing Tiger Woods videos when he takes a video of you is baffles me. <laughs> exactly. I mean, he's, he is what he is. He's phenomenal, and, and nobody can take that away from him. And, and he has so many great traits that, that the average person doesn't have a prayer of imitating. So we don't, we don't do that. We look at your swing and say, this is... Let's say you have 10 traits in your golf swing, and seven of those are really good rotary swing traits. Well, I'm not going to all of a sudden say, well, you know what, you need to, you need, Tiger does this, and, and you know, Nick Price does this, and, and Nick Faldo did this, and now you need to change your swing to do those things. That doesn't make any sense, because there are a set of fundamentals that you will fall within that you already have more traits for, but now you need to understand the other three that are missing to make your swing work. And it may not look anything like Tiger Woods, but trust me, when you see the ball fly the right way, you won't really care what your swing looks like on tape, or you'll get over it very quickly. Uh, yeah, I hope so. And <laughs> But the rotary swing, now you're saying your version, the rotary swing is almost a hybrid between the two or a tendency to be more one than the other? Yeah, it's certainly more one plane than anything else. Mm-hmm. It, uh, my, you know, the arms are shallow at the top or on plane with the shoulders. You have a little bit more tilted over spine. You use your body very aggressively through the ball. If you've ever had that tendency, if you've gone and taken a golf lesson and your instructor said, oh, we've got to hold your shoulders back and bring your arms down on the downswing. Don't turn your shoulders. Well, in the rotary swing, you know, what we found is what, basically what you do naturally if you did anything else in life. If I told you to pick up your club, get angry, and throw it down the fairway. The mechanics that you would use for that same motion or hitting a baseball or softball are the same motions that you would find in the rotary swing. Mm. You would set your weight onto your left side. You would rotate your hips and chest and shoulders and everything through, and then as you come into impact, your body would be open and your arms would fling off your chest. It's a very natural athletic way to swing the club it's not adhered to trying to make things one extreme or the other. It's a very balanced, neutral way. And that is, of course, as, as I mentioned, we, you know, now we have a biomechanical endorsement as well saying, yeah, this, this is exactly how you would naturally, the body biomechanically naturally wants to move this way. Interesting. Interesting. And so now let's talk about, all right, we've, we've focused on the swing. Let's talk about the results. Um, what is the difference in a one plane versus two plane as far as ball flight and uh, your your distance. Are there going to be changes, significant changes you'll see from one to the other? Well, here's here's what you've typically seen in the past. To answer your question, the simple answer is no. They should be. If you're proficient at either one, you should see similar results. Now, what I find is people who read Jim Hardy's information and did exactly what they felt he was trying to get them to do have lost a tremendous amount of distance especially with the driver. They may hit their irons a little bit further because they hit them more solidly now, but they've lost distance with the driver. And, and there are mechanical reasons for that and, and what have you, and, and typically his one-plane swingers were not long hitters on the tour. Um, theoretically, in a perfect world, a two-planer could have a little bit more club head speed with the driver because there's more release with the arms which, and hands, which is a little bit more difficult to time and control but there's a little bit more speed available. Now, in the rotary swing, we allow for that same release, or very similar release that you would see in a two-plane to a degree to allow you to have that, that increased club head speed with the driver. So, But in terms of ball flight, um, really no, because you, you would never see a pure one-planer or two-planer or what have you. There's always going to be little discrepancies that are going to dictate ball flight. For instance, you know, if somebody has a really strong grip and they hold on to the face and they're trying to hit a fade all day, that just might be their preference, even though his mechanics might dictate that he should hit a draw. So 
uh, a lot of it has to do with your spine angle. The spine angle really is what dictates ball flight, to tell you the truth. So a lot of that has, you know, there's so many little variations in the swing that you would never, you would never consistently say, this is going to hit this way and this is going to hit this way. Wait a minute. <laughs> well, what do you mean the spine angle dictates ball flight? Absolutely. Um, really? It, yes, absolutely. Expand on that one for me. Okay. If you think about the way that your body works around your spine, if your spine, let's just, I'll just exaggerate things. Let's say your spine's very much leaning toward the target at impact. Well, that's going to force you to swing on a very steep, almost out to end path. Okay? So, in doing so, you're going to have a club that's going to come in on a steep plane and slightly over the, over the ball, and you're going to tend to hit little pull cuts. And that's totally dictated by your spine angle. You can't, you can't manipulate that. Now, if you change and say you tilt your spine angle back and move it away from the target, that's going to actually cause you to come more from the inside. And now you're setting yourself up, depending on the amount of, we call it axis tilt, or how much your spine is tilted away from the target, now you're going to start to come more from the inside and hit kind of a little bit more of a high draw. So it's totally dictated. And if you have a neutral spine, you can, you can be in, in the middle there. But basically, the spine angle, because of the way you're rotating, that dictates the path that the club's going to come down on. Very interesting. Good for you. Um, let's, uh, let's spend the last uh, minute or two here talking about uh, your website and the unbelievable amount of content that you have available to golfers all over the world. Um, you've got two different websites, rotaryswing.com, which we mentioned, and oneplanegolfswing.com, and plane is P-L-A-N-E, golfswing.com. Um, and what, what are the services that you have available uh, to our, your guests? Well, basically, we, you know, we have a couple of instructional DVDs that, that we've had really great success with, a full swing and a short game DVD that cover a lot of the things that we've talked about today, but in a much simpler, easier-to-digest fashion. Uh, and, of course, my book is available on the site, the Rotary Swing book. But the main thing that the website's all about is there's over 120 instructional videos that I've done on the site that cover everything from putting to short game to full swing. And, and what the site's there for is to elaborate more in depth on things that I've written in the book or things in the DVD that, for, for brevity's sake, we didn't go in and, and elaborate on something very technical or mechanical or what have you, so, or we didn't have time to add that many drills. I mean, there's probably 20 or 30 drills, videos that I've done on there that are just specific to doing rotary swing drills. Or So it's basically a support site that allows you to go, if you want to learn more about the rotary swing and you've read the book and now you're saying, okay, well, I totally get this, and the book's telling me what to do, but I tend to miss this way. I was, for instance, I just did a new video yesterday uh, titled basically coming too far from the inside. So for golfers who tend to hit blocks and hooks and they're coming too far from the inside and their divots are facing a little right, there are mechanics that are at work there. And again, a lot of it has to do with the spine angle again. The spine angle tilting a little bit too far away from the target at impact is creating that dynamic. So that's not some, that's, a, that's a one-off thing that you really couldn't put in a book. But it's something that fits perfect on the website to say, look, when you're doing this and you're, and you're hitting shots this way, here's how you fix it. And so it allows me to keep content very fresh. We add new content, new videos every month. Uh, we, you know, we take requests from the members on our forum. We have a large, you know, over 4,000 members on our forum that participate and ask questions. And so when they say, you know, I'm really struggling with this, how do I fix it? A lot of times it's just much easier for me to, to do a video because it helps lots of people at the same time. And rather than trying to articulate it in text, which is pretty difficult to do. So we have a little golf studio set up here. We film the videos both at, uh, at our academy in Orlando and then also indoors. And so it allows us to be pretty responsive to uh, you know, the members' needs. Awesome. Awesome. All right. I'm not going to let you go without giving us one good drill. <laughs> one good drill. Yeah, I'll, your I'll, favorite I'll, one. Well, the best one that's, uh, that we certainly have is, is the, the one I mentioned earlier, the rotary drill. Yep. Because... And in, in literally in 60 seconds, you can learn every single thing you need to learn about the golf swing. In 60 seconds. It's that simple. If, if you achieve the proper position at the top, which is very easy to do, and the drill shows you exactly how to do it, and just rotate. Don't think anything else. Just turn. That's all you need to do. And that's how we start almost every single lesson still today. And that's how we get such good results because 
you might have come to me with 10 different swing thoughts, and now you have one. And it's a very simple one. It's something that you can visualize, you can feel, and you can practice. And, of course, it's on the website, so it's very easy to see how it's done properly. Very good. RotarySwing.com. Chuck Quinton, thanks so much for joining us on Golf Smarter today. You bet, Fred. I had a pleasure. It was a great, uh, great talk, and thanks for having me on. <laughs> 